so without further ado, let's introduce to you our speaker, Clint Wilder, who is senior editor at Clean Edge, a clean tech firm, research firm, and a co-author of two books, Clean Tech Nation, which we're going to be talking about today, and also Clean Tech Revolution, which came out in 2007. And he's an award-winning business journalist who's covered the high tech and clean tech industry since 1985. And he has uh, co-authored many reports and columns on industry trends for Clean Edge and is a regular blogger at the Huffington Post and has been a facilitator of the global Clinton Global Initiative. So let's welcome Clint. Thank you. So to get things started, Clint, let's talk about um, what prompted you to write this book, Clean Tech Nation. I mean, the roots of Clean Tech Nation were really in, in the first book, Clean Tech Revolution, which, as Lisa Ann said, came out in 2007. And the, um, I had been working with, with Ron at Clean Edge uh, for, well, about three years when we first talked about the idea of doing a book. And uh, it's interesting, I, I was the, the, the writer journalist of, on the team, and uh, Ron, who is a very good writer, but his background was business and marketing. Um, so he said, you know, I think this book is, uh, this, this sector is ripe to have a book written about it. The clean tech was just emerging. Um, and uh, you know, not not well known to the to the mainstream. Uh, and I said, you know, I, I, as a writer, a lifelong journalist, I've always thought about writing a book. I always thought it would might would be about baseball, but <laughs> someday. <laughs> and, and someday it could happen. Uh, but um, so we, you know, we sort of started the process, and uh, it, it, it's a lengthy process to you have to do a proposal, get an agent, shop it around, et cetera, et cetera. But we were fortunate to get a, a good offer from HarperCollins. And so that was the Clean Tech Revolution. So 2007, and the book was uh, pretty successful and uh, translated into seven languages, which we're very proud of. Um, and then uh, we were you know, thinking about, should we do another book? And what we were noticing, so it, with Clean Tech Revolution, the subtitle was Clean Tech Revolution, The Next Big Growth and Investment Opportunity. So this is a book about the business of clean tech and basically kind of telling people this isn't just you know, hippies throwing solar panels on a roof. I mean, these are you know, some of the world's largest corporations and investment firms really involved in it. And there's a lot of money to be made in the, the growth of venture capital and you know, when it was, things were really taking off. So, you know, fast forward to, I guess, a couple of years ago, and so our book had been out then, well, three years at that time. And what we were seeing, and it was also reflected in some of the work that we were starting to do at Clean Edge, which I'll talk about, was <clears throat> clean tech not only as a, as a you know, a, a growing industry, but as a cornerstone of economic development at the local, city, state, and ultimately national level. And you know, particularly this conversation always sort of begins with China. Uh, and so when we were re when Ron and I were doing research for Clean Tech uh, Revolution, we attended in 2006 uh, the first what's called Renewable Energy Finance Forum in China conference in Beijing. We also went to Shanghai on that trip. Um, and you know, China was just kind of putting out these plans, saying, you know, we're gonna do all this a lot, put a lot of money and a lot of development into clean tech. And you know, we, the, the rest is history, right? I mean, they've just you know grown into the, the world's largest solar manufacturer, the world's largest market for wind power, the world's largest maker of uh, uh, Batteries for electric vehicles and other, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, and this was, we saw the US slipping behind. Um, and Germany, another clean tech powerhouse, just, you know, continuing to do their thing, and lots of other countries too. Um, so, you know, and we felt strongly that, you know, the US shouldn't, shouldn't fall behind. Um, and it's not just a national pride thing. I mean, this is jobs, this is, Balance of payments, trade, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was really, you know, our, our motivation, and it dovetailed with work we were doing at Clean Edge, where we launched um, our state clean energy leadership index. So we've done we've done three years of that, uh, where we rank the 50 states in, in uh, clean energy leadership, 
clean, overall clean tech leadership. And you know, a big component of that is, is its jobs and economic development and, and how much of the workforce is, is in this. And because we think, you know, the, our, our thought here is that these are the key industries for economic leadership globally in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the, the message we want to want to get out there. So what type of research did you do for this book? How did you develop the insights and the opinions? Well, it's a, fortunately, a, a lot of it was work that we were doing at, at Clean Edge on the, um, on the state index, and there's a chapter about state leadership. Um, for, for, the, for the global landscape chapter, that was, you know, kind of just hunkering down and, uh, you know, we, 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 we know a lot of the right people. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, knowing, knowing who to interview, as, as I always say, as a journalist, uh, when people say, you know, ask me a question, I say, well, as a journalist, I don't know the answer, but I know who does. Right. Right, <laughs> and, right. and so fi finding the right people. And, and that's, you know, I think it, 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 makes, it makes a good book when you have a lot of different voices besides just the, the author, or in this case, right. authors. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so, so that's a big part of it. And then we also, uh, at that time, we were doing a report called uh, Clean Tech Job Trends which included the, the top 15 cities for clean tech jobs. So there's a chapter on that. Now we, we've kind of uh, broadened our city research, because last week we launched our first US metro clean tech index, ranking the 50 largest metro areas in the US. And uh, happy to report San Jose finished number one and San Francisco number two. <laughs> So there's going to be a little bit of rivalry. Yeah, uh, yeah San for sure. San Jose. Yes. So um, the main takeaway from the Clean Tech Nation, I guess, would be the seven-point plan mm -hmm. that you have, which is um, the most actionable part of the book. And um, you know, it's got some things in there people might expect, like a national renewable portfolio standard. Mm -hmm. um, and but I'm also interested to know what are the recommendations here that people aren't going to expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is so, you know, if you write a book that where the subtitle is How the U.S. Can Lead in the New Global Economy, we felt it's important to kind of explain, you know, okay, so what, what, yeah, yeah. yeah what, what are you going to do about it? Uh, so the, the final chapter of the book is the seven-point action plan for repowering America. And um, I think for the kind of unexpected ones, um, probably our most controversial uh, plan item recommendation is to phase out all energy subsidies over 10 years. And you know we, we've seen the call for um, even President Obama has talked about oil and gas subsidies. Um, and phasing those out. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but we think that it would, the controversial part, at least in the clean tech industry, is. Wait, but what, what about our subsidies? But we really believe that if you project out 10 years, if you look at the trends in, in the downward uh, pricing, the costs, uh, particularly solar, has been incredibly dramatic with a lot of ancillary results. But you know, for, for users of solar energy, it's, you know, it's, solar has never been this, this affordable. Uh, and with wind power is uh, coming down, you know, all, all technologies tend to drop in price over time. Uh, so you, you take those trends, and then it, we, we think it's a very unfair, unlevel playing field right now. Uh, that the amount of subsidies going to the fossil fuel industries are orders of magnitude more than, uh, than, than what's going to clean tech, which means, you know, drives me crazy that, you know, Congress can't pass a the new production tax credit for the wind industry is costing thousands of jobs already. Um, and uh, anyway, I can get on that soapbox all night. But uh, so we think, you know, given this like 10 year period, if you can ha get a truly level, level playing field at the end of that 10 years, we think wind, solar, and other uh, clean energy technologies really could compete on their own merits in the marketplace. One of the other things that um, people might not expect is a national, uh, oh, I didn't write it down. I'm ad living right now. Um, national Infrastructure Bank? Yes. Can you tell us mm -hmm. some more about that? Yeah, that's, um, this is a, a, sometimes known as the Green Bank. 
Um, the idea, it's, it's a um, uh, financial mechanism that leverages both uh, public and private capital for large infrastructure projects. And this is not, the, the, I, the concept is hardly new. Uh, there's a great model called the Export-Import Bank, some of you may be very familiar with, uh, which uh, has been around since the 1930s. It's part of the, the, the New Deal. Uh, and it's, you know, just has, has leveraged uh, billions of dollars in investment in infrastructure projects outside the U.S. So, you know, why not take that same idea uh, to, for, you know, grid improvement, large-scale, uh, large-scale renewable energy projects, et cetera. And in fact, this is already starting to happen at the state level. The state of Connecticut has, uh, has passed uh, something like this. And the city of Chicago, is, it has launched. They don't have any projects that have started yet, but that was just announced by Mayor Rahm Emanuel uh, earlier this year. So, you know, it, the, the, the benefits of it are, um, uh, we think, very clear. And it, it would be a really good thing to have at the, uh, at the national level. And there's a, a group in Washington called the Coalition for Green Capital, uh, headed by former FCC Commissioner Reed Hunt, who we, who we quote in the book, is you know pushing for this. Mm -hmm. And then what about um, fully funding military projects mm -hmm. related to clean energy or, or renewables, um, clean tech in general? Can you tell us a little bit more? About yeah, that's I, I, it, it's kind of uh, it's not well known to a lot of people that one of the biggest supporters of of clean tech right now is the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. um, both for their combat operations, for just you know more effective and safer operations, uh, because they know that the, you know the statistics on the number of casualties from people, uh, troops and contractors too, mm -hmm. either uh, transporting or guarding fuel convoys is just it's staggering. I mean, it's one of the most dangerous things in, in, that we've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so you know, if you can replace that fuel with uh, with solar, for example, uh, you don't have the you don't have the weight, um, and you don't have these you know tankers. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's also very expensive. But I forget the exact figures, but it's like you know hundreds of dollars a gallon uh, when when you add up the costs of getting that fuel to where it needs to go, um, and then at the same time uh, making the the bases. Um, here, here in the U.S., energy efficient, and powering them with renewable energy. So, you know, some of the most eloquent speakers I've, I've uh, heard in the process of writing the book about the benefits of clean energy have been people in the military. And um, so, you know, it seems like a win-win, and yet <laughs> some of our politicians have chosen this area of military spending to, you know, to attack. Um, because you know the the, for, uh, the the big issue has been biofuels, which are, of course, more expensive right now. But you know this ignores the entire history of the Pentagon in funding early stage technologies mm -hmm. and helping them develop that, which will bring the cost down right. eventually. Right, throwing their weight behind it and leveraging their buying power, yeah. basically, to, to to establish a new industry. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, this one, this, in, in a way, this recommendation is simple. It's just say, you know, the military is already doing this. Keep doing it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, more, more, more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open us up for uh, questions in a minute because I'm a big believer in, like, these conversations always get really interesting when the audience starts asking questions. Mm -hmm. I can research everything, you know, till the, the you know, till the cows come home, but you guys are going to have much more interesting questions than me. So I'll ask you one more and then we'll sure. open it up. Um, it's been my experience that typically in this country, states move a little faster on controversial issues than the government does, and I mm -hmm. think our, our government is sort of built that way, to move a little slower. Yeah. Um, and so let's talk about the cities and states that are getting clean tech right. Mm -hmm. Who are they, and what can we learn from them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, we, all, we all live in the right place for this. Uh, California has been number one in our state uh, in, in uh, leadership index all, all three years by a pretty wide margin. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, 
in the, in the recent metro index, uh, San Jose number one, San Francisco number two, but uh, Sacramento and Los Angeles are both in the top seven, I think. So it's, you know, it is just, um, uh, it, it, it's not, not just the Bay Area, obviously. Um, so, you know, but the, the, you look around the, the country, Austin, Texas, Boston, uh, Portland, Seattle, Denver, um, they're all Chicago. Um, they all have, you know, different lead in different aspects. And the, you know, I guess the good thing about clean tech is it's so many things that so you know Portland leads in, in green buildings. Chicago has become a center of wind industry jobs. Um, Boston is a leader in energy efficiency. So you, you know you can you, you leverage what what strengths you have. Um, now here in the Bay Area we have, uh, you know, this the, the perfect storm of, of, that, of that's probably a bad uh, <laughs> metaphor. <this one. laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, of uh, for for clean tech development, you've got you know great research universities. You've got the venture capitalists. You have the entrepreneurial culture. You have um, great resources. Great solar. Uh, you know, we get a lot of sun. Um, and so it, it's, you know, the, all, all those elements. W when we talk about uh, clean tech development at any level, um, we, we always said there, there are three pillars that, that you need, technology, capital, and policy. So um, it, you, you know, I think you could probably, if you analyze any technology-based industry, it's probably the same. So you need people developing and building the technology. You need people funding it, and the, but the policy uh, piece of this is so important, and that's one thing that you know we track very closely at Clean Edge, and it's always an important part of, of, of clean tech leadership, either at the state or city level. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions? I did have a question, a follow-up to the sure. one you just answered. Um, um, when we're talking about the top cities that we, are we talking about in terms of companies that are based there or the city itself because as far as I knew Houston was the number one city in terms of uh, buyer of renewable power like the city uh -huh. uses That's the right. most renewable yeah. power in the country yeah, yeah. Uh, which you wouldn't expect from Texas, yeah. Houston. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. But well, that's and because, because that's, a, that's a city policy. Wind also. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Well, let me... Uh, we're well, yeah, I do, yeah, because I, I can't, uh, I don't, don't remember all 15 cities off the top of my head. Uh, but the, the, we, the, the chapter called uh, Centers, Centers of Innovation. What page are you on? Because we all have a book now. Right? Yes. Uh, if, please uh, turn your text to <laughs> Page 120. Now this is, um, so, so this is from our 2010 Cleantech Jobs uh, report. And so the, the rankings are, are different in our brand new index, which you know, just came out last week, obviously. Too late for the book. But yeah, you see Houston at number eight. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's surprising in some ways. But the other thing, Houston is the energy capital. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of what cla gets classified as clean tech jobs are people working to make the use of fossil fuels more efficient, both you know within the fossil fuel industry and 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 the use of it. So that's you know that's that's energy efficiency that counts as clean tech. So that that's you you, you see some uh, su surprising things there, but in in the um, in the Metro Clean Tech Index which you can read about on our website. It's a subscription product to get the whole thing, but you, we, we do put out the, the top cities and, and executive summary on the website. Uh, we have four uh, categories. It's green buildings, advanced transportation, uh, clean electricity and carbon management. So that's where, and I think Houston does well there, but as, as you mentioned, because the city is the uh, largest purchaser of green energy. Uh, by a city. And, um, and the last category is innovation, investment, and workforce. So we, so we hit all the, you know, the technology, capital, and policy is all 
uh, covered. Anybody else? Um, you mentioned Connecticut was was doing a few different innovative things when it comes to kind of just finance mm -hmm. in the clean tech uh, industry. Yeah. Do you know anything about the Clean Energy Finance and Investment Authority? And um, do, what other states have a similar initiative? Because I know it's relatively mm -hmm. new. It is relatively new, and it's interesting. It's headed by a, a guy named Dan Esty, who was a Yale professor who uh, co-authored a best-selling book called Green to Gold about uh, you know companies, um, really sustainability initiatives really paying off at the bottom line. And uh, so he's a super smart guy, and so that he was uh, you know brought in by the governor to run this new. Um, Clean Energy Department, if you will. I forget the exact, it's in the book, because we, we do quote him. Um, and they have been really at, at the leading edge with, with, with the Green Bank, with, I think they have, a, the, uh, uh, they have an initiative for uh, funding, funding the PACE, if you're familiar with PACE, uh, Property Assessed Clean Energy, I think it's in for, uh, which is uh, uh, where you can pay off uh, solar uh, through your, uh, uh, it, through your city uh, property tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, Connecticut's a, a great model. You know, we'll be watching it to see how successful it is because it is. it was just all passed earlier this year. Right. Okay. Anyone else? I saw somebody agree with me. Um, so uh, I have to say, I didn't read your 2007 book, but, but since then to now, it seems like fracking has, and natural mm -hmm. gas bill, it just changed the whole picture and do you see that and how do you see how things have changed from 2007 to now yeah based on that's that? it, it's it's been a, a huge uh development in, in affecting the clean tech industry um you know basically resulting in uh, a very large amount of low cost natural gas which of course in, in the you know cost is the name of the game yeah. and so it's you know harder for renewable sources to compete with with this very cheap natural gas. Now, the good news about it is it's really uh, knocked coal out. Uh, and natural gas is much cleaner than coal. No? Okay, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that. We can make it a discussion or you can finish in the next. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I should say. As far as carbon emissions and greenhouse gases go, as, natural gas well, would be cleaner. Well, life cycle. Yeah, there's yeah, right. there's, yeah. there's uh, controversy about it. Mm -hmm. um, Burning natural gas in a, in, 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 in a power plant compared to a coal plant is is much cleaner. The, what I think you're about to say is, you know, the, with the fracking process itself and the uh, transmission of the natural gas, there's been a lot of leakage and methane is very powerful greenhouse gas. So it's not yeah, it's not great. It's not perfect. Yeah. 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 Do you? I mean, some people see it. Some some people will say it's like a bridge mm -hmm. for us to get from off mm -hmm. fossil fuels and onto more full renewable energy. Yeah. Well, there, w there there's it is there, a fossil fuel. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm a bit off. I'm sorry. Off of carbon. Yeah. There's um there's an interesting um the, the interesting development. We see more um, plants of doing both, like building a big solar array next to a natural gas plant and, and using both. And the, the current natural gas plant technology is such that you can uh, fire them up and down much faster, which makes it you know, a, a good pairing with solar or wind, which are intermittent. So yeah, I mean, we do see, we do see a bridge, but you know, anyone who's um, you know, out there trying to compete with low cost natural gas will say, you know, yeah, but it's 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 really tough. Now I think I don't think the prices are gonna stay at this low level. Um, and the the uh, the price of natural gas overseas is still much higher than it is in the US. So um, you know it's kind of a why would a, you a, say what, that it wouldn't stay at this level? Well I think right now it's that there's it's like the Wild West and there's so much Going on that, that you know, and I'm I'm not an energy trading expert, but I think you know the, the, the speculation is that it's just there's just going to be this all this supply, um, and I think for well, one thing, I mean, if we have you know, 
fracking is very controversial, and you know, I will think all it takes is one big accident, uh, and and, uh, um, and you know, it could it, the the industry could get set back, and then mm -hmm. prices would go up. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? You started off by saying it um, it actually all starts with China. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see China's influence on clean tech and in particular solar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, 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 uh, the, the question of global competition in, in clean tech starts with China. Um, so, <clears throat> and I think, well certainly, you know, in, in solar, uh, the, the effect on prices has just been dramatic. Um, it's so so much production going on in China and bringing bringing the costs down, and that's you know a real double edged sword. Because you know if you're in the business of making solar panels, trying to compete uh, at, at, on a product that's where the prices are dropping, that's really hard, and that's what happens. Solyndra and uh, you know, and, and a lot of other companies too, um, much bigger companies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but if you're on the end of, in, you know, buying it, installing it, it's you know, things have never been better. So, um, so you know, th that there, there's that influence. But you know, you said just the the shift of the, you know, the industry on on the production side. Just you know, China is. The center of everything now, and that's you know that's happened very quickly, really. Uh, and we, you know we do see it um, a lot more uh, wind wind power uh, components coming from China as well. There's a question in the back. I have a question. Uh, you might have touched on this in your book. I read again, but um, for clean tech energy, um, if the Republican Party does win, in your expert opinion, what do you see? Maybe like three point minutes would be a long mm -hmm. answer, but what do you see occurring from that? What are, what, well, well yeah. um, so I mean, it d depends on what that victory looks like. Obviously, if so, if if Romney won, and let's say, and the, the, what do you see it, in the next four years, right? With yeah. Romney leading the country. <clears throat> yeah. Well, my my colleague Ron Pernick is going to have a column. Out the day after Collection Day. No, no, no. It, it's it's sort of like you know, it's a, a message for the next president, um, or the, or the or the current president uh, reelected. Either way, um, so he hasn't written it yet. But <laughs> uh, but anyway, I think um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not going to say that. I, I I think it would be a, a huge setback. I really do. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, fairly confident, but very nervous at the same time, <laughs> uh, because I just, you know, I don't, I've just seen the rhetoric, and it, it, it's, I think, you know, you could take any, you could, you know, take the joking about climate change, or, you know, you could pick any, any one of any number of comments that Romney has made, but his, the fact that he, Opposed the the ex extension of the of the tax credit for wind, right, right. which put him on the opposite side of that issue with many many Republican governors in places like Kansas, uh, North Dakota, you know, uh, it, it's um, Oklahoma. Uh, the, the governor of Oklahoma said, um, "I agree with Governor Romney on ninety nine percent of <laughs> of the issues, but not this one." So, it, it, because, you know, this is, it's about jobs. And so, it, you know, if he's willing to, you know, go, go to the Paul Ryan side of things to that extent, it's, uh, it, it could be a very, very bad four years if, if that happens. I mean, I understand, like, I've been watching the election <clears throat> coverage, and it's, you know, it's very clear that like nobody talks about clean tech. No one, they're not yeah, talking about right. renewables. They, they did. I, they actually did a little bit in the second debate. Tiny bit. Yeah. Yeah, they could talk yeah. about but it was, gas. 
and energy independence. And Which everyone right. knows and is clean yeah. coal. Oh, like yeah. 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 So, I mean, and I get it. Yeah. I get it. There's a lot of there's a lot of money backing them. I get it. Good one. <clears throat> yep. But it is jobs. Yeah. We're actually we're talking about an industry that was. You know, in, what it was like three to eight percent growth during the recession, right? And you know, it just it's just compounding. It's just continuing to grow, and it just seems like they're not seeing that the way we see it now. We're very much we're much closer to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it does there does there come a point where that um, that uh, those election financial contributions get overshadowed by the, just the enormous amount of jobs that are being created in this industry? Can we get to that point? I, let's let's repeal Citizens United. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I know it's it, it yeah. It, it you know, I, like like you say, we you know we've seen what what's happened in this campaign. So you know the the uh, that that all the the good things about. I mean, you know, it's not only is it not being touted as good, it's being attacked. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. And you know. Uh, 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 very unfairly, I think. Um, we always seem to be on the defensive, and is it possible for us to get on the offensive in, in this industry? Well, you know, that's where I think, you know, hopefully. <laughs> Bring it uh, back to the budget. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, because this is we we really made an effort to to be bipartisan, and you know, focus on the, those those issues that you know any poll. The American people really like clean energy, and then if you ask, you know, do you do you support things like innovation, entrepreneurship, you know, tech, homegrown technologies, national security, not to mention clean air and water. So, um, you know, there's no, there, there may be climate deniers, but there's no like, you know. Uh, deniers of that clean air is better than dirty air. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't so. it all about the finances, the monetary the backing of oil and oh. right? Yeah. So, so that's a tough battle. Yeah, it is. So recently some of the news corporation shareholders, some of the big private funds like CalPERS have been trying to uh, limit the powers of the Murdoch family. Mm. And they can't do it because the second largest shareholder is um, a Saudi billionaire. So the, oh, news uh, uh, and, and I'm forgetting his shape, you know, what you will call uh, it, but he's, it's all oil money. Mm -hmm. So news corporation, all of it, Fox, you know, movies, mm -hmm. television, newspaper, it's controlled by a Saudi billionaire. Mm -hmm. So it's really Al Jazeera in this country. <laughs> <laughs> no, Al Jazeera is not, not yeah. pro Saudi billionaires. Yeah, it's, no, it's, I don't. Yeah, Al Jazeera is actually pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, talking back, maybe back to policy. In terms of also like leveling the playing field by removing subsidies, what about um, what's the future look like for either a carbon tax or cap and trade? Is that do you see that as being a necessary component to leveling that playing field? I think, I mean, we get asked a lot, you know, why, why isn't that one of your recommendations? And because, and, you know, what it would be, a, it would help things a lot, but we just don't see it happening. It, uh, you know, we, we want things that, even though some of ours are ambitious, but I think, you know, the, it, 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 because it has the word tax, and I think also the, the, the cap and trade, I mean, we'll, you know, we'll see we're, California is leading on that with the AB 32 about to, you know, get launched. But it's so, just going to push people out of California? Like, well, you know, this is, state thing, right? yeah, I mean, I was on a, a, a conference call with journalists on, on Monday about this, um, about implementing AB 32, and, um, yeah, that's, you know, it's one of the, you know, it's kind of like this big experiment, right? And, and we'll see, I mean, there, there are some, you know, it's so complex, but there are some safeguards in place to tr try to not have, you know, just send all the all, all the uh, carbon emissions to Nevada, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, uh, you know, a, a carbon tax it, to me is the ideal thing. But in terms of, you know, a prescriptive list of, of, of policy recommendations, we just we thought it would just get, you know, be 
kind of dead on arrival it, here here in 2012. Now maybe you know maybe things will change. I mean you know we're going to have we know we're going to have a lot more climate disasters like we had this week. Um, if that changes the conversation, maybe. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah, what do you think state and local government should be doing to um, promote the clean tech work as a role in job growth in that sector? Well, I think, you know, you, you kind of said it, it's like, like, you know, put it out there as this is, this is a, a job creator. Now that's, you know, and, and, that, and that's come under fire in the, in the political realm. So, you know, we do, as a clean tech industry, we do have to deliver. Um, because you know it, it, it is kind of under under the microscope, uh, but you know. But I think it, certainly here in in Northern California, you know, you've got a supported population to uh, to make to make that happen uh, more. But you know, it, it, I mean, anything that you that where people are aware that it, it is a growing industry and and it has. It's helping the, the job situation. That's that's the best thing you can do, I think, for the for public support. As you were reporting the book, what what were the hypotheses that that didn't make it for, through interviews, mm. or things that surprised you in interviews? That's emergent ideas that came out mm. as you were interviewing folks. What were some of the, the things you hadn't heard before? Yeah. Um, Exactly. I think with some of our um, recommendations, I mean, it, it's. I, I think you know, I, I learn things a lot that I I didn't know. Like one of the one of the the uh, recommendations that I think could be the easiest and could have a huge effect is opening up these financial vehicles like master limited partnerships and. Uh, real estate investment trusts to uh, to to, to uh, clean energy investing, and it's you know the, the, there's just some kind of tax code changes, um, and that you know I was like, really? That's it? Yeah. And, and and you know to hear like yeah it's out there and a lot of people are are talking about it. So it was, it, yeah it's kind of a a, a light bulb moment, um, and then you know I think I, I, I'm always um, in the cities chapter. Uh, there's a, a we have the 15 top 15 cities and then five best of the rest smaller cities and I mean some of it I knew already but it, Toledo Ohio uh, with a, a transitioning from the glass making to solar uh, now of course they they've been hit with you know the solar manufacturing uh, downturn and not down you know the the, the, the cost crunch but um, uh, Spokane Washington which I'm sure uh, Melody's familiar with um, it's the center of uh, the world's largest uh, smart meter company. Itron is based in that area, and so that's sort of a little clean tech cluster. Uh, Reno, Nevada, of all places, geothermal and some some wind power companies. So those were kind of you know fun little eye openers. Any more questions before we wrap it up? Okay, so I see renewables is totally separate from like the smart grid, because one's all about networking and communications, and the mm -hmm. other's much more about uh, materials and building new innovations. You know, mm -hmm. so um, but where so where do you see so some things definitely like policy, I can see affecting some things, but mm -hmm. what about the smart grid? Because that's that's huge. It's it's existing utilities. It's not like new innovation. Um, mm -hmm. In a way, it's well. It's like, actually, I, I mean, uh, I, there there's a ton of innovation in the smart grid space. Smart grid is a pretty broad umbrella, yeah. so it's not just you know a utility you know making things better, but you know you have these, as you say, it's 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 very huge. It's all about information, really. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, the, managing the flow of electrons better. It's so so bad and inefficient today. You know, it's mm -hmm. just the, the grid is so antiquated. Uh, but you know, there's a, 
everything from you know the smart meter company, uh, you know, to, to managing these uh, you know huge distribution centers, the, the grid operators. Uh, it, it's there's the opportunities for innovation are huge. Is there a policy that, that yeah. needs to change, or is that policy well, already in place? I mean, is there something no, about I mean, no, smart they're, they're, different than these yeah. other things that the smart grid doesn't get, you know, head to head with the oil industry? You know, what I mean? right, like, right. But it, yeah, but but it, it but it is, you know, the utility industry, which is, you know, as uh, um, there's enough the, inertia. Yeah, th yeah. Thank you. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, so the, you know, market. which the the utility industry is about the same. Age as the oil industry, uh, I think, well, roughly, and uh, so yeah, it's 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 hard to change, and, and it's you know it's so regulated, so policy is it, yeah. it is really important. They've made yeah. a lot of investments. There's not a lot of incentive to to yeah. to embark on some new technologies. What do you think about? Like some people talk about um, smart buildings growing faster than maybe the smart grid. Yeah. So like the market is saying, mark the market is saying, we want this building to be smarter. We want this clusters of buildings to be smarter and work mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. How do you see? Like, is that a separate avenue to in, to increase our energy efficiency and increase and sure. sort of bypassing this the, the snail's pace of, of the utility yeah. industry? Yeah, I, I would say so. That that's a, you know the the. Uh, these building control systems that can, you know, power areas of the building up and down, and uh, with with uh, whether it's the air conditioning or the lights or, or whatever, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it makes a huge difference, uh, and and you know that everything connects to the grid at some point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, not everything if you're off the grid. But, Do you think that yeah. would eventually push the smart smart grid as far as utilities go mm -hmm. to 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 innovate a little quicker? Yeah, it could. I mean, it's just like you know. Utilities, we tend to lump them all together, but they're not all the same at all. And I mean, you see a, a lot of more moving faster and more innovation from the municipal mm -hmm. utilities in Palo Alto, in Austin, um, and uh, it, you know, more more than the investor-owned. And they, you know, they tend to be smaller, except for LA. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say that the smart grid is very much important to renewables because that's what's going to enable wind and solar to get to places that don't have wind and solar. You need the transmission lines, you need the ability to take advantage of when solar is available, the storage capacities and capabilities, and same with wind. And, and that's why we're talking about natural yeah. gas being able to fill in a gap there when solar and wind aren't available because you can shut it down and right. turn it on faster, right? right? But but I think that the smart grid is sort of the smart grid independent of the renewables. Yeah, I mean, eventually when renewables become more than one tenth of one percent of the power that's actually being used, I think that then the utility really has to have that smart but grid, I, like you're saying. But, but I saying, think not having it is also hampering you, the development of those yeah. types of power because big, you can't yeah. send it anywhere, so you can't make money because you can't deliver it. A big part of smart grid is being able to integrate intermittent renewables. And, and, and distributed yeah, renewables. Distributed. That, you know, they're, they're, mm -hmm. The grid's set up for one big old honking coal plant, mm -hmm. you know, or nuclear, you know, just churning out the power, uh, you know, uh, and uh, <clears throat> um, you know, it's centralized mm -hmm. and 24 7. Mm -hmm. And now we've, we've got both intermittent sources, and they can't be centralized big solar plants, big wind farms, um, or you know, the, or, or individual rooftops. I, I guess my point is, like, do you think if Romney gets elected, there's going to be a shutdown of innovation in the smart grid? I, I kind of don't think so. No. I, no. I mean, <laughs> but there will no, be a no. big shutdown in, like, I, renewables. I, That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, it's oh, right. oh, yeah, oh, oh, animal. Oh, the different political oh. animal is smart grid than all this other stuff. I, that, uh, but maybe I'm wrong. That's just my impression, so, I mean. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I guess it's... very it's, different sort of deployment. Yeah. Challenges and advantages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the and, and issues that you know they need smart grid despite even if it weren't renewables, you'd be yeah, smart you're right. Grid. Well, smart right. grid doesn't yeah. depend as much on investment tax credits and other forms yeah. of yeah. subsidies yeah. that yeah. are politically driven right now. That's true. Yeah. But it depends on the the will of regulators and, and investor owned utilities to make these kinds of investments. It depends on what part of smart grid you're talking about. For if sure. you're talking about, you know, this. Uh, 
you know, grid side, distribution side, yeah, the transmission side, side, but then there is yeah. certainly all the consumer side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last question. Um, well, I just was just to follow up on the smart grid conversation. Um, I think over the next couple of years, you can look for a lot of smart grid deployments overseas more than mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, and uh, um, I don't know if it's policy related as much as just like need related in a lot of um, other no developing grid. countries. Yeah. Like yeah. here, it works pretty well. So it's like if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and we're not going to spend a ton of money. And then one thing I just learned today about smart grid because we bank a couple of the big smart grid companies, Trillion uh, uh, and uh, Silver Spring, is um, the largest utility in the U.S. is still smaller than you know uh, the largest you know than the smallest utility in Europe or in the U.K. So our um, yeah, yeah, so they're yeah, just yeah. serving like really, really big populations. So now it's kind of yeah. like, well, might so I think you'll probably That's see more um, deployments overseas because it's one utility for the whole country. Mm -hmm. yeah. so no, that actually no, or even if it's not like the biggest utilities here, apparently you know like three million people, three to four million people, no, they're and they're just like ten, fifteen. No, they're bigger than that. Yeah, I mean, definitely bigger. So, Very so interesting question. Though. But maybe there's some de debate here, but it is intriguing to figure out exactly what, which is more advantageous to, if you're a smart grid technology to promote it here or in Europe. Certainly yeah. Europe is a much more favorable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So for instance, if you want to buy or sell a home in Europe, if you, if you want to rent a home, it must post its energy efficiency rate, rate mm -hmm. legally required to tell mm -hmm. you yeah. Yeah, on and multiple points. It's a standardized formula. And so, mm -hmm. and it's considered every person's right before a hand, like even if you're a renter, you have a right to know the energy efficiency of that home before you pump down your money. Yeah, well, it's like knowing the foundation or the insulation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, that right there would a huge difference that would make if, if every home buyer thought, ooh, I've got to get my energy efficiency rating in order in order to sell my house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the realtors go around saying, oh, this is going to really be good. <laughs> so redoing your bathroom. Yeah. 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 Just uh, yeah. since we're talking yeah. about energy efficient <laughs> buildings, uh, probably some of you already know this, but the largest um, green building conference in the country is here in San Francisco this year, mm -hmm. coming up in two weeks called Green Build, yeah. U.S. Oh. Green Building Council. So uh, check There's it out. There's another green. This green festival. festival. Yeah. 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 That's big, but oh, yeah. Green Build yeah. is yeah. huge. Yeah. It's yeah. more promotional, yeah. I guess. The yeah. And it's not yes. always in the Bay Area. No. no. That's right. No. Yeah. 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 Sure. So if you want to volunteer, that's a way to to get into Green Build because it is a hefty price tag. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Do you have? Connections there. So the volunteer for, for volunteer. Yeah. Yes, contact me. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I know some of the people on the board. Okay, right. so yeah. contact me. Um, so let's wrap up with this question. So um, ultimately, we want to get more people on board with clean tech, and um, sometimes I feel like we live in a little bit of a bubble here. And uh, I'm from the Midwest, where I, when I was a reporter for the environment and clean tech, people looked at me. Sort of cockeyed, yeah. I guess, from Mars. Cold country. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so how do we motivate people in those sort of in middle America mm -hmm. that tend to just sort of fluff off, you know, just shove off this whole topic as being, pardon my French, but a little BS? Mm -hmm. Like, what, well, how do yeah. we, I mean, well, that seems like be, be sort of where we got to go next. Yeah. Well, um, uh, my most recent trip was to Lubbock, Texas. Mm -hmm. And it just happened to be the site of a conference I go to every year called Society of Environmental Journalists, hosted by University of Texas Tech is there. Uh, and they, West Texas is a huge area for wind power. And, you know, they're not, they don't think of it as um, some uh, weird, you know, uh, ephemeral thing. I mean, this is money. You know that the people or the, the wind developers are paying these cotton farmers or ranchers, uh, you know, for their land, and you know, and it's you know ma making electricity. And they're used to. What was fascinating was the, the history of using the wind 
in West Texas with these, um, you know, these old style windmills. It's sort of a, you know a, a symbol of the, te the Texas plains, right? Mm -hmm. And they're they used to pump water out of the aquifer because um, you know it doesn't rain a whole hell of a lot. And so you know, then just wind as a resource, as an energy resource, is, goes back, you know, over a hundred years. So uh, you know, this is kind of a, a different way way to answer, but. I think you know there there are a lot of pockets of clean energy development and even leadership in places you wouldn't expect. You know, it's it's not. If you look at um, you know the, our the, the, our top clean tech cities, yeah, it's you know it's the it's San Francisco, Portland, Seattle. Um, but but there are, you know if you look beneath the surface because you know we. we we look at all the 50 largest cities, so it's all in there, and you can pick out, you know, oh, well, interesting. Why are there so many electric vehicle charging stations in Nashville? Well, um, outside of Nashville is a big Nissan plant. So, you know, and so, and so now they're making the Nissan Leaf in Smyrna, Tennessee. So, and, and people, you know, in that area are, are you know, um, Job, jobs doing, yeah, exactly. So the, I, I, I loved it when I read that the, you can charge your electric vehicle at a Cracker Barrel restaurant. <laughs> Speaking of the South, I was looking at a, I was looking up something, a renewable energy portfolio standard map, and mm -hmm. there was a big hole yeah. where the South was. North Carolina has one, yeah. but it's yes. just it's blank all the well, way down to Florida. Yeah. So um, what can we do down there? Well, you know, they're, they're just, it, it's, I think the name of the game there in the South is kind of the, you know, the, has the farthest to go. Um, but some, some, um, so, some states, uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, have been luring clean tech manufacturers. Uh, even though, you know, they don't have, they, stuff might not be deployed there, but, um, it, you know, it's it, as 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 a as a job thing, mm -hmm. and so I, I think you know that's sort of I, I keep you know coming back to jobs, 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 but I really do think that's you know the way to raise awareness and, and you know and to give economic benefit, um, associate economic development with clean tech rather than Al Gore. You know. All right, that's all we have. That's all the time we have. So um, Clint's going to be here so you guys can ask your questions after that. And he can sign books if you haven't had your book signed already. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.